In this chapter, I will discuss the dynamics of uniform circular motion. Uniform circular motion is the motion of an object traveling at a constant speed on a circular path. Here is an example of such circular motion. We have a model airplane tied to a string and held by a person. And so because of the string be, uh, being held in place, at the center of the circle, the airplane is going to go around like this. And the airplane is not constantly accelerating as it's going around the circular trajectory. So therefore, the speed with which the airplane is going is constant. What changes is the velocity of the airplane since the airplane is going around the circular trajectory. So the direction of the velocity changes, but the magnitude is constant. In this course, we are only going to consider situations where the circular motion is a motion with constant speed. So therefore, there is no acceleration as the object in rotation is um, moving along that circular trajectory. The time that it takes for an object in a uniform circular motion to complete one full revolution around its trajectory is called the period of rotation and it's labeled with capital T. So then for a circular trajectory with radius r, knowing the period of rotation, one could calculate the speed of rotation. The speed of rotation will be equal to the circumference 2 pi times r divided by the period t. Essentially, this is the same as distance divided by time. As you can see from this relationship, the radius doesn't change. The period of rotation is constant since the object is not accelerating as it rotates, so therefore the speed is constant. Let's do one example problem to illustrate the concept of period and how we calculate the speed of rotation. So this example is about a tire balancing machine. The wheel of a car has a radius of 0.29 meters and it's being rotated at 830 revolutions per minute on a tire balancing machine. Determine the speed at which the outer edge of the wheel is moving. So I want to find the speed, the speed with which the outer edge of the wheel is moving. And so that means that I need to use the relationship that I showed on the previous slide, v is equal to 2 pi times r divided by t. Um, in the statement of the problem, I don't have the information about the period of rotation. However, I have the speed with which the wheel of the car is being rotated on the tire balancing machine, and that is 830 revolutions per minute. So that I can use, that information I can use to find the period of rotation. So if I divide 1 by 830 revolutions per minute, that will give me how, many, how much time it takes to complete one revolution. So 1 divided by 830 is equal to 1.2 times 10 to negative 3 minutes per revolution. So that means that it takes that much time to complete one full revolution. So then if I convert that time to seconds, that's going to give me the period of rotation. 
And so 1.2 times 10 to the negative 3 minutes is equal to 0 0.072 seconds. That is the period of rotation. Now I have all the information necessary to substitute in the relationship that finds me the speed on the edge of the wheel. So I get 2 pi times 0.29 meters divided by 0 0.072 seconds, and that is 25 meters per second. The reason the object tied to the string here is moving along a circular trajectory is that this object is under the action of a force, and therefore there is acceleration which acts on this object. This acceleration is known as centripetal acceleration. The main question here is, what is the direction of this acceleration? We know from Newton's second law that force is proportional to, is equal to mass times acceleration. And we know from kinematics of motion that when the acceleration is in a direction in the same direction as the moving object, then the velocity of this object increases. But here, in the context of circular motion, the velocity doesn't increase in magnitude. The speed remains the same. The only thing that changes is the direction of the velocity. The magnitude remains the same, but the direction changes. The velocity is just tangential to the circular traje uh, trajectory at any point during the rotation of the object. So then the question is, what is the direction of this acceleration which causes this object to go around the circle? The direction of this acceleration is towards the center of the circle. The centripetal acceleration is a vector which points towards the center of the circle. And the label is A sub C for centripetal acceleration. The centripetal acceleration always is always directed towards the center of the circular trajectory. So here, the centripetal acceleration points towards the center of the circle. If the object is here on the trajectory, then the centripetal acceleration points towards the center of the circle. If the object is here, then the centripetal acceleration points towards the center of the circle. This is extremely important to remember. So, because the centripetal acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity of the object, that's why the speed doesn't change, the magnitude of velocity doesn't change, only the direction changes, and we get this circular motion. Well, now the question is, what is the relation, uh, what's the relationship between this centripetal acceleration and the speed of motion? It turns out that the centripetal acceleration is equal to the square of the speed divided by the radius of this circular trajectory. The units here remain the units for acceleration that we are familiar with, and that will be meters per second squared. Now let's combine the notion of Newton's second law and centripetal acceleration and see what force is present during the motion of an object that undergoes uniform circular motion. Newton's second law states that when a net external force acts on an object of mass m, the acceleration that results is directly proportional to the net force and he has a magnitude that is inversely proportional to the mass. The direction of the acceleration is the same as the direction of the net force. And so from the second law, we know that the acceleration 
A is equal to the net force divided by the mass, or in other words, the net force is equal to the product of mass times acceleration. So then, for an object that is undergoing uniform circular motion, we know that the acceleration, the centripetal acceleration, points towards the center of the trajectory. So then, the second law tells us that the force that is causing this object to change direction as it's moving here also must point towards the center of this trajectory. This force is known as the centripetal force. In uniform circular motion, there must be a net force to produce the centripetal acceleration. The centripetal force is the name given to the net force required to keep an object moving on a circular path. The direction of the centripetal force always points towards the center of the circle and continually changes direction as the object moves. From Newton's second law, the centripetal force Fc is equal to the product of the mass of the object and the centripetal acceleration Ac. And if I substitute the expression that I um, showed for the centripetal acceleration, namely v squared divided by r, the centripetal force can be written as m times v squared divided by r. The centripetal force can be a number of different specific forces. So let me give you a few examples of forces that are centripetal force for the particular type of motion. For the example that I've discussed so far with an object of mass m undergoing uniform circular motion because this object is connected or it's tied to a string, the centripetal force here is the tension in the spring uh, in the string. So the centripetal force is the tension. Now consider a satellite orbiting the Earth. For this satellite, the centripetal force is the gravitational force with which the Earth pulls on it. So the centripetal force here is the gravitational force. Now consider a car that is driving on the road and it is taking a turn. So this turn is a part of a circle with some radius r. The force that is placed the role of centripetal force here is the force of static friction. Why is that? It's because um, if the car starts to slide towards the center of this turn or away from it, then that means that there will be also acceleration that will change the speed of the car. So, to keep the acceleration, the centripetal acceleration constant, that means that there has to be static friction between the tires uh, and the road, not kinetic friction. Let's do one example problem using the concept of centripetal force and centripetal acceleration. The model airplane shown in the figure here has a mass of 0.9 kilograms and moves at constant speed on a circle that is parallel to the ground. The path of the airplane and the guideline lie in the same horizontal plane because the weight of the plane is bound by the lift generated by the wings. Find the tension in the 17 meter guideline for a speed of the plane of 19 meters per second. So we know that the centripetal force is equal to the tension in the guideline. And the centripetal force is 
the product of the mass of the airplane times the speed of the airplane to the second power divided by the radius of this circle, so the length of the guideline. So substituting all the values in the expression here gives us 0.9 kilograms times 19 meters per second to the second power divided by 17 meters, or that is 19 newtons. You can see from this result that if the speed of the airplane increased was different, more than 19 meters per second, uh, that means that the tension in the guideline would be higher. And if the speed of the airplane decreased, then the tension in the guideline would be smaller. So if this airplane is moving with large enough speed, that is going to produce a tension force in the guideline that eventually will become large enough to break the guideline. So if that happens, then what would be the direction of motion or the trajectory of uh, this airplane if the guideline breaks? Well, since the velocity is tangential to the trajectory at any point of the trajectory, Newton's first law will apply. Why? Because once the guideline is broken here, there is no net external force acting on the moving object. So then the moving object will basically be moving along a straight line with constant speed. So that means that this airplane will continue to move along a straight line along which the velocity at that moment of time when the guideline broke was pointing. So I talked about the centripetal force for a car that is driving along a flat road and taking a um, turn. So unbanked curve. The static friction force is the centripetal force in this case. However, if the turn is banked, the centripetal force is something different. So a banked curve is a curve that makes a angle with the horizontal. And so then a car taking a banked, uh, a turn on a banked curve is going to, again, move along a part of a circle with radius equal to the distance from the position of the car to the center of the turn. But if we draw the free, the free body diagram of this car as it's taking the turn, the forces that act on the car look like so. So there is no friction in this problem. So therefore the car, if it slides up or down, will experience no friction. However, we want the car to be a fixed distance R from the center of the curvature of this turn. So the car is not going to be sliding up or down. Okay, we know that the weight of the car points straight down towards the center of the earth. And we know that the normal force that is generated by the surface acting on the car will be perpendicular to the surface. Okay, so then I must introduce a coordinate system in which I will have a component that will be the centripetal force causing the car to go around the turn and, other, and another component which will balance the weight of the car. And so the choice of coordinate system here is obvious. I'm going to have a positive y direction vertically up from the ground and positive x direction to the right. 
In this coordinate system, the normal force has two components. He has a y component, which is calculated as fn cosine of theta, and this y component is going to balance the weight of the car. And then the normal force has an x component, which points in negative x direction. That one is equal to fn sine of theta, and that is the centripetal force in this uh, particular example. So fn sine of theta is the centripetal force. So that means that fn sine of theta is also equal to the mass of the car times the speed of the car to the second power divided by the radius. And the uh, y component of the normal force is equal to the weight of the car. So then if I take the two expressions and divide them by each other, fn sine of theta divided by fn cosine of theta, that's going to produce tangent of theta. And then on the right-hand side, I get v squared divided by r times g, and the masses will cancel out. So then that expression that I just got is going to allow me to calculate the angle theta that uh, the bank makes, uh, the curve makes with the horizontal. But I can also use this expression to figure out for a uh, set angle of the turn with the horizontal, what velocity is, uh, what speed is going to be safe to drive with in order to not slip off the road. So when the car is not slipping on the road, in either of those directions, then there is no friction force between the tires and the road, and therefore the only component of the centripetal force will be the x component of the normal force. So then I can use this expression to figure out at what speeds for a particular angle theta um, the turn, the turn is, can be taken without slipping on the road. And so here is the example. The turn said the Daytona International Speedway have a maximum radius of 316 meters and are steeply banked at 31 degrees. Suppose these turns were frictionless. At what speed would the cars have to travel around them in order to remain on the track? So the expression that I will use to solve the problem is the expression that was derived on the previous slide. From here, solving from V gives us square root of R times G times tangent of theta. And then replacing all, or substituting all the known values in this expression gives us 43 meters per second or 96 miles per hour. So when cars are going with that speed around the turns, they are not going to slip on the road. Another example of motion with um, of uniform circular motion would be a satellite orbiting around the Earth. So we want, uh, the nature of the motion is that the radius of the orbit is kept constant. So then that means that there is a particular speed with which the satellite is going around the Earth for which the radius remains constant. So let's derive an expression for that speed. The centripetal force here in this particular situation is the gravitational force. And the gravitational force is calculated as the gravitational constant times the mass of the satellite, the mass of Earth, and the distance from the center of Earth to the satellite. On another hand, this is also equal to the mass of the satellite times the speed of the satellite to the second power divided by the radius of the orbit. So from here, solving from the speed v, the expression that calculates it is square root of g times me divided by r. So square root of the gravitational constant times the mass of Earth divided by the radius of the orbit. As you can see, this expression here is not dependent on the mass of the satellite. It only depends on the radius of the orbit. So it can, this, a satellite with any mass 
will have the same speed of its uniform circular motion around the Earth as long as the distance from the center of the Earth is kept constant. Let's do one example using the expression derived for the speed of a satellite. Let's determine the speed of the Hubble Space Telescope orbiting at a height of 598 kilometers above the Earth's surface. So the speed is calculated as, as the square root of the gravitational constant times the mass of Earth divided by the radius of the orbit measured from the center of Earth. So that would be square root of 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons meter squared per kilogram squared. That's the gravitational constant. Times the mass of Earth, which is 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms, divided by the radius of the orbit, which is the distance from the surface of the Earth, 598 times 10 to the 3 meters, plus the radius of Earth, which is 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters. Calculating this gives us 7.56 times 10 to the 3 meters per second, which is 16,900 miles per hour. So one more time, for satellites, the speed of around the, circ uh, the uniform, uh, during uniform circular motion around their orbit is not dependent on the mass of the satellite. Now I can calculate also the period of rotation around the circular orbit for a satellite. I know that the speed of a satellite is calculated as the square root of the gravitational constant times the mass of Earth divided by the radius. But on another hand, this speed is also equal to the circumference of the orbit divided by the period of rotation. And so from here, solving for the period, I get that the period of rotation of a satellite is equal to 2 pi times the radius of the orbit to the power of 3 halves divided by square root of the gravitational constant times the mass of Earth. This formula here and the one for the speed can be also applied for other celestial objects, the moon, Mars, the sun, anything, as long as the mass of this object is known and of course the distance um, or the radius of the orbit is known as well. Here's another example having to do with artificial gravity. The question is, at what speed must the surface of the space station move so that the astronaut experiences a push on his feet equal to his weight on Earth? And the radius is 1,700 meters. So when the question is asking for the speed with which the station is going to be moving, they mean the rotation about the central axis here. So when the space station rotates about the central axis, the astronaut, uh, astronaut you can consider as an object with mass m. This object is undergoing uniform circular motion, so therefore this object is under the action of some centripetal force. So in order for the uh, astronaut to experience zero gravity, the centripetal force must be equal to the weight of the astronaut on Earth. So the centripetal force here will be equal to the weight of the astronaut, but also that is equal to the mass of the astronaut times the speed of rotations to the second power divided by the radius of this circle. So solving for V, that gives a square root of R times G, and substituting the values provided in the problem statement, that is 1,700 meters times 9.8 meters per second squared, which gives us a speed of rotation of 130 meters per second. So thus far, I discussed circular, uniform circular motion uh, in several examples um, in a horizontal plane. Let's look at what happens to the forces present and the centripetal force in a circular motion that is in a vertical plane, such as this motorcyclist going around a vertical loop with radius r. So there are four positions that 
uh, are characteristic for that type of motion with respect to how the forces act on the motorcyclist as he is going around the loop. So we have position one, two, three, and four. In position one, the weight of the motorcyclist points straight down, and of course the loop is going to push on him with a normal force F and one. And so the centripetal force here in this particular position, position one, will be equal to the difference between the normal force F and one and the weight of the motorcyclist. That would be the net force here. So this is the centripetal force in position one. At the same time, the centripetal force, of course, is also equal to the mass of uh, the motorcyclist and the bike, of course, times the speed with which they are, uh, the motorcyclist is going around the circle at that point, divided by the radius of the loop. And so the speed here will be V1. All right, so then the motorcyclist reaches point two. The weight still points down, but now the normal force points perpendicular to the weight. And so the centripetal force at this position, 2, is simply the normal force F and 2. At the top position 3, we have the weight uh, pointing down. The normal force also points down. And so then the centripetal force is the sum of the normal force Fn3 and the weight. So this here is position 3. And so this is the centripetal force Fc3. And finally, at position 4, the weight points down. The normal force Fn4 points towards the center. And so that is also the centripetal force. Fc4. So you can see here how the centripetal force changes based on where exactly around the loop is this motorcyclist. This concludes the lecture on dynamics of uniform circular motion.